Hello and welcome back to the Talking Leadership TV podcast series. Welcome to our first podcast for November. This month marks our last month of podcast for 2023. So I'm hoping you'll enjoy the list of guests that we have for you this month. Our guest today is Jim Wilmot. He is a long-term defender of the rights of rural and regional communities. He was born in Perth in Western Australia. His family moved to regional Queensland in the mid-1970s. His early years were spent on the family's small crops and beef cattle farm west of Gympie where he developed a passion for primary production. This led to him being awarded a distinction in applied science and agriculture, specialising in agronomy. His post-tertiary pathway started with a distinguished public service career where he accumulated an extensive practical experience in protecting both agriculture and the environment. His leadership did not go unnoticed and he was nominated as Citizen of the Year by Emerald Council. At a state level, his accomplishments were awarded with a Mark of Achievement Medal from the Department of Natural Resources and Mines. He later received the prestigious Premier's Award bestowed by Peter Beattie, former Premier of Queensland, for his services to rural and regional communities. From 2014, Jim has been back farming in Queensland whilst continuing to provide consultancy services to private enterprises and local government. Jim's love and passion for rural Queensland has inspired him to lead many successful initiatives protecting the rights of farmers and their properties, calling for more essential services to rural and regional areas. He's played an active role in many community organisations, standing up to government and commercial entities alike that ride roughshod over people's livelihoods and property rights. He now has a role as Chairman of Property Rights Australia, a grassroots organisation supporting local communities whose property rights are under threat and whose voices are not being heard. I hope you'll enjoy today's podcast. I enjoyed having the conversation with Jim. Thanks for supporting the podcast, but enough from me. I'll hand over to today's guest, Jim Wilmont. Jim, thanks for joining me on the podcast, mate. It's been a long time in coming and uh, full self-disclosure for those that are watching this. I do do some work for Property Rights Australia and you as the chair of Property Rights Australia. So I'm, I'm thanking you for being here. So um, to start with, can you give me some sense of your leadership pathway and what that looked like for you? Um, yeah, thanks, Eric. Thanks for having me. I guess I got involved in... Um, I guess you can call it uh, like way back when I was in school, just playing uh, rugby league and a touch to Aussie rules and um, was captain of uh, the uh, rugby league um, a, a team at school, in primary school. And so, you know, that was all a little bit about leadership and uh, working with the fellas to achieve a goal together. And then I, I guess going through um, university and then getting my first job, um, that was about... Um, you know, working with people towards a common goal and getting people to see that goal and um, achieving it together. So back out into like my professional roles with uh, local and state governments in different areas of Queensland and New South Wales, that was all about, it was more than, it was more than just management. It was about, um, you know, having a vision and getting others to follow you. So I guess working at a um, outside a professional organisation and outside of government and also inside government um, has really given me, I think, a good exposure in a lot of different areas of what it takes to um, to get to, to get to the goal that um, you want to get to and to get people to follow you and believe in that goal. Yeah, thank you. Uh, what interested me in that response, Jim, is that um, I've had a lot of guests who have worked for local government or are currently working in local government and I'll ask you in a, in a broad sense if I can what have you gleaned about effective leadership from your local government experience yeah good question um let me tell you straight up that uh leadership isn't about management um, a lot of people uh, look at people in executive positions or high-level management positions, middle, um, low-level management positions, and, and I think uh, they're their leaders. Um, leadership is um, not management. So what I see is a lot of people, there's been a lot of enga engagement of people put into these positions um, that are there to achieve their KPIs, um, some key outputs. And there's a lot of, and that's all they're, they're focused on. They have the blinkers on in that respect. And there's a lot of disengagement of people. They don't realise to achieve 
those KPIs, the plans, um, the ultimate goals that they need to bring people with them. And a lot of managers struggle because they focus on the numbers, the facts, the planning components. They don't focus on the people. And uh, the good managers that I've seen achieve um, focus on the people first, the people front and centre, because without that team, without having um, a vision that they can see and engaging them, you'll never get their respect, you'll never get their full commitment, and you'll never let... To me, a good leader grows people. And um, the good leaders that I've seen uh, focus on that engagement and the growth of people and that clarity that people can see where they need to go and what their part is of it. And those kind of people are, are becoming uh, rare. Um, but you, they stand out. Um, they stand out, mate, when you do see them. And, and that's what I've seen. And I see it in a lot of different sectors right here at this point of time as well. There's too many managers, not enough leaders. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, and it, you, you helped answer the question around what is your definition of leadership and you've just gone through that. It's not management and that's not uncommon in the feedback that I've had with previous uh, podcast guests the, that moving away from um, leadership is not management and, you know, the all, of, all that goes with that. What, what is interesting in your response, and again, it's it seems to be a common thread, is leadership is about developing the team. And so if you can develop your people, encourage encourage them and have an environment where they can be successful, then all those things that you talked about, meeting your KPIs and getting those jobs done, kind of get done. Um, not not yes. doing that is the opposite of what leadership is, if I'm hearing you correctly. Definitely. Yep, exactly. That's right. So on on that on that um, on that note, when you're looking at leader capability, so I'm shifting slightly here, but it's still related. For, from your perspective, and again, you've had multiple careers. It sounds like not just in government, but outside of government. What do you see if you had a, a list of those things, and the list can be as long as you want it to be? Obviously, is what are the capabilities in leaders that you think are critical? for effective leadership? I think one of the key things is communication and the way you communicate with people um, and the art of engagement, whether it's in a group or it's interpersonal like we're doing right now. And, and you see it in public. You, you see a lot of leaders and now, well, I'm going to call them managers. They just don't listen to people. Um, they're looking around, I've got, I've got to do this and that, but they don't listen to people's stories, how they feel, what's going on in their lives, checking in with them. And um, a, a good leader does that as a priority. Um, he checks in with people, makes them feel comfortable, um, takes a real interest um, in their lives and how they feel. And and once you get that and then works and 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 be honest, be, be honest with them as well, saying how are they feeling. Um, don't just be um, a closed shop and say, you know, I've got these things going on in my life as well. Open up a bit and really use empathy. And um, leaders that use empathy and combine that with very good communication and, and using this active listening and closing this with a bit more um, are the people who run very successful organisation teams and achieve the ultimate outcomes. So to me, a leader is about um, having a vision and they can see that vision of where they need to go to and making working with people using all those skills I've said in, um, previously and getting them to see that vision as well. And if people can see the vision and they're truly engaged to achieve it and want to achieve it, really you'll get there with the people that work. And really a leader over time should make their role defunct because people will grow to such a level around him, they'll just take it and run. And so the leader can just sit in the background and not be out the front. A leader doesn't have to be out the front all the time. Sure, they have to be out the front uh, and lead by example. Um and get their hands dirty. Um, the, the best thing that I, I, whatever happened to me 
when I was um, starting my career was going out with um, with prisoners and doing um, natural resource management work in a lot of different areas and getting my hands dirty. And it gave me a real understanding of what that job was about, what, what is real on-ground action about to achieve stuff and and working with other teams besides prisoners and getting and when you're up there speaking about different issues at a more strategic level you can drop down and use that knowledge and people go oh well he's done that before i really like this person because he's been out there engaged he's got his hands dirty he knows what i'm talking about and you'll see people open up more and willing to listen and maybe willing to follow if they like what you've got to say yeah that's quite a um an interesting mix of, of, of capabilities there, not all technical and more a bit about how you carry yourself in the workplace and whether or not you can apply empathy, sympathy and be sort of genuine in what, what it is that you're doing to the extent that you want to um, achieve a particular outcome. That makes a lot of sense to me. Now, given all this to this point, and I know you're probably sick of having the discussion, but... Um, I'll I'll have a crack anyway with the following. We've all sort of been through the uh, good, the bad and the ugly of the COVID process. And from a leadership process perspective and seeing the leaders around you, again, not wanting to identify particular individuals, what do you think the impact on the leadership process has been from what you've seen or is it too early to make some definitive statement about that. And what, what I mean by that, by an example, is pre-COVID, you might have been very rigid about, you must be in an office, we must do this, this this is the structure. Whereas through COVID, you had to have remote working, you had to have different ways of doing things. And there are different processes and mindsets required to change that structure. Do you think that will stick longer term in terms of how you lead your people or will it revert back or where are we is I guess what I'm asking you here in a, in a very long-winded way. I think with COVID we've learned that um, technology has helped us to stay in touch and um, as because we live in a world where we just get so our access to information you know there's information everywhere and, and I think um, like well, I know myself that I, I struggle with dealing with the load of information that's coming at us, uh, contemplating it, reflecting of it, and then making an informed critical decision and using my evaluation skills to do that. So, and I think it's not just me, it's everyone that's struggling and how we actually achieve that together. I think um, from COVID, we've learned like we're doing now, Eric, with um, Zoom and and using this type of medium, it's definitely a tool and has helped us get through COVID and out the other side. But I think what it's done, one of the bad things about it is people use that as the only medium to engage and consult. And the danger of that, mate, is um, there is nothing like um, face-to-face interpersonal communication um, where you're talking to people real life in the flesh. And I think uh, a lot of um, leaders uh, have um, just focused on, they've kept with that electronic version um, and they don't put so much priority on the face-to-face because everyone's getting busier as we get this more. It's just becoming so hard to spend the time to do the face-to-face, talk in small country halls, talk face-to-face with groups of people. But that's an essential you need to have a balance. And I think people are still trying to work out that balance. Um, I, I can see it in the way a lot of, um, let's talk a, a little bit about governments and how they roll out, say, policy development, um, the creation of policy. Well, creation of pol- any policy at any level, you've got to um, talk to stakeholders to get their views, what the issues are, to build some of the context of the policy and work out what what really are the key outputs of what you're trying to achieve and address. And what I see is that people aren't spending the time to get really good consultation outcomes. And so you don't get good policy. And what I'm seeing across the landscape now on all levels of government um, is that the policy that is developed isn't really hitting the road. The policy is missing the key issues because they're not listening and actively engaging 
with people at grassroots at, at all different levels, um, but particularly at grassroots. And and let's face it, mate, a lot of the policies um, they affect grassroots communities. So we've got to learn that yes, um, electronic communication like we're doing now is definitely a key. Doing stuff electronically um, through the internet with submissions is great, but you've still got to get out and talk to people. And um, that is the key, mate. So we've, as leaders, still have to look at how we do that, spend time, put time aside to do that and work that in as part of the whole strategy going forward. Yeah, I can't disagree. I, I think um, if you look at it from a system, like the, a systems perspective, the consultation process at whatever level of government to develop better policy making from our political leaders and senior leaders in, in councils or, or government agencies is the information coming from those that they're meant to be helping to govern and that that require, requires some leadership foresight to be able to gather that together um, to, to completely go the other way and use non-face-to-face -face means to do that. Yeah, you lose something. I, I, I'm, I'm still struggling to, in my own mind, and this is a personal perspective about how ineffective is, are, sorry, are the technologies to get better engagement with people versus the face-to-face. -face. And part of me thinks there's something innate in people that when you can eyeball someone, not, and I'm not talking in an aggressive way, but you're in the room, you're talking, you're debating, it can get heated or not heated, but you get to understand the perspective of the other. And I think um, from experience in other industries that I've worked in, and I'm not going to go into it in any detail here, but suffice to say, and, and I guess the experiences I've had working with yourself and others is that we are heading to a new normal, if I can use that ridiculous phrase, for how you consult with people and non-attendance to an online forum or non-attendance to a survey that you put in and then a tick off that they've done consultation is really does a disservice to the meaning of the word consultation and the meaning of what it is to be a leader in that process to get information that is not necessarily the best that they can get. Now, understand that there are costs involved, but the population's only going to get bigger. And so the excuse that we don't have the time to engage, um, it's too it's all too expensive or we're worried about the safety of our people. In the, from a leadership perspective, I guess it's a cop out. Um, that that that's a personal view. I can understand that there are limitations. You can't consult every single person, yeah. but not having any meaningful consultation is also not is also problematic. Again, personal perspective. That interesting view, Jim, I, I, it's a view I share. Others may not. And if you're watching or listening, if you have a contrary opinion, love to have you on to talk about that. If someone can convince me the online forum is the best way um, to get information for our leaders, um, be up for that discussion. Now, um, before we get on to the, the last couple of themes for the discussion, Jim, I... I want to tease out one thing that you talked about when you're talking about engagement, this idea of being a good communicator in that regard, do you think you lose something in your pitch or ability to influence when you're not face to face? Or could you not influence, influence me, me to do something talking face to face like this? I mean, sorry, through zoom versus actually seeing me in a room and doing the same thing? And if so, why do you think that? What What's lost there? Um, I think what's lost is, like, remember, like, well, depending on what your beliefs are, like we are, we are mammals, yeah? And um, it, I always look at, like at the moment, where, like I'm running a, a beef operation and I always look at the body language of uh, and that's such a powerful thing. Body language is such a powerful thing. You do get a bit electronically on Zoom, but there's nothing like seeing it. It's in um, a whole person, the way they speak, the way they move, and they weigh the eye contact and just the use of hands, um, slight gestures, 
And people don't realize, people have lost a lot of that ability and capability. And I think doing it face to face and engaging people like that, um, you might only have to do it, say if you've got a policy cycle, you might only have to do that 10, 10% of the whole cycle. But if you do that at strategic times, you will get people way more engaged when you use a medium like this because they're going, oh, yeah, I remember Jim or Eric. They said, yes, I can see I remember when you talk that. And there's more buy-in to the process. If you isolate that and don't use that face-to-face, which is still critical for the successful success of the other key components of the whole cycle that you're trying to achieve and getting people to follow you to the ultimate outcome, to your red lantern. So that is why I think it's so important, mate, because people can check you out. People can see instead of like on whether it's Facebook, whether it's X, um, you know, all the social media, like they're good for low, like for some kind of information dis- dissemination. Um, but there's really, you've got to have in-person communication to actually drive, not drive people, to take people with you. And that's why we're getting such poor outcomes when it comes to a lot of government spending and policy rollout and a lot of organisations, whether corporate or whatever. They have all the jazzy mixes and all that and they have the the big PR campaigns. But really, in reality, um, a, there's a lot of rubber that's not hit the road. There's a lot of inefficiency and waste of money because they're not spending the time to actually engage people, either one-on-one, small groups, large groups, to so people can check them out, so people can see who they really are, not a polished, tarnished um, portrait of someone who hides behind a screen. That's that. You need that. You, you need electronic uh, communication, but people want to see who you are, and that's where it's important, mate. So um, I'll get to the next theme, and this one is a personal favourite of mine to ask my guests. Um, the nature versus nurture question, are leaders born or are they made? Yeah, that, that is a good question. Mate, I think it's a hybrid, yeah. I think they're, um, I think, yeah, it, it, it's in people. And I think, though, that there's many great potential leaders that never get exposed or given the opportunity. And I think that's a damn shame. I think in reality, there's a lot of people, all all people are leaders in some degree. And I think if they're given the opportunity and that's switched on and you grow people, I think we've all got the capability to be leaders. Um, So, yes, it's from nature, but it is in all of us, mate. Um, some people don't want to be out in front and seen as a leader, but they can be a leader in different ways. And I think a smart leader acknowledges that and looks for the best in people and how they become part of the whole approach to get success. Um, it's not a leader isn't about there's a lot of selfish people out there and that try and clamber over the top of other people to get to the goal and Really, mate, that's not going to work long time uh, in, in the long term. Um, and to have strength of an approach or a strategy, if you've got people covering all different aspects that feel that they're engaged and that they're leading um, to a degree, like you will get a lot stronger momentum that can, you know, cop a bit of a hit here or if someone gets crook or there's someone is um, having problems, you get other people to help them because you're checking in with them. You know what what their situation is. You can help them and you can help overcome. If other people see that happening, they go, geez, Jim really cares what's going on. You know, I'm going to double over and help this because I really believe what Jim is talking about. I can see what he, he really cares for us. And, geez, if I see him in a corner, well, I'm coming to rescue Jim and I'm coming to rescue Sam and come to rescue Sally and that's where you build a formidable team. And don't get me wrong, um, yeah, I just, I've seen so many people that have great skills and leadership, but they're never given the opportunity because 
they might be seen as coming from this part of a different class of people or they haven't got much money or that doesn't matter. Um, there are so many potential like, great leaders out there in our communities, but they're just never given the opportunity to punch through the ceiling. And um, I think, yeah, if we can grow people and acknowledge uh, everyone's good at something, mate. Um, and I think that we can really, Australia's got a great future if we take on those simple things. And, yep, everyone's got leadership. So back to your question, everyone's got leadership capabilities. Um, someone doesn't want to be, a lot of people don't want to lead from the front. They want to lead from the side. They've got really good skill sets. And I think um, acknowledging in that and um, thinking a leader just doesn't have to be out there in front of the cameras or leading a part of a team. Really, like I said before, a, a good leader grows people so they can be leaders. And then the, the the initial leader just disappears and dissipates and moves on where that team just follows their, their self. They self-lead. They support each other. What what I was thinking as you were giving that response and thank you, thank you for for sharing that with us is this idea that not just be being able to give people opportunities to lead but creating an environment where it's a choice because I think leadership uh, at its, uh, for me, fundamentally is about you need to choose to be a leader in a situation, whatever that situation might look like. And um, yeah. uh, you can't really get to that point if the environment or the ability for you to give it a go is not there. So I'm, I'm hearing what you're saying. So Jim, I appreciate these responses and uh, to finish, if we could go back in time to a younger version of Jim, uh, <laughs> way way back in the uh, in the in the good old days, yeah. and and look into that crystal ball to give yourself some advice about being a more effective leader, what would you say to a younger version of yourself? Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, if only I could go back in time, I would say that. Growing people around you to achieve and really, I guess, building relationships with people, uh, working relationships, yeah, and and also caring for people. I think um, as a young fella growing up, like, you know, I, I rushed past all those essentials um, and only touched on them in time. And looking back now, if I'd used what I know now back then, um, I could have had a lot more success in rolling out additional initiatives, but I could have, I guess, grown a lot more people um, to achieve success as well and, and help people and help communities. So yeah, if I did it again, I'd use what I know now. So leadership is about a team approach, mate. It's not about an individual Sometimes you have to lead from the front, but it's about growing those people and getting respect of those people and helping people to achieve their full potential. And I think um, that's been lost on a lot of us. And I think we need to revisit those leadership foundations. Um, and I think that, like, I've done a few leadership courses before and, you um, you know, the thing with leadership courses and management courses, you get all trained and all the theory and you have skits where, you know, um, you work on your leadership style and that, but then it's finished and you go away. And then a lot of people just revert back to, oh, where it's safe again, I'll go back to this way of doing things because that's how I've always done it. I've scraped through where really there needs to be more avenues for people to reconnect after they've done or been exposed to certain events in their lives where they've had to step up and talk about that like we are here, I guess. And um, that grows people. Um, you learn off other people as well. Geez, that's a good way to do it, um, Eric. That's, you know, I, I might try that back in my workplace or back in my life or back in my team. And I think that networking is a key and um, having those avenues for people to network and share their stories um, will help us achieve greatness so, yeah, as a country, as a nation, um, if we do that more. Um, we can get Australia back on top. Thank you for your time today, mate. No worries. Thank you, Eric. Good to be here. 
Thanks for joining us today. That concludes our podcast and discussion with Jim and I appreciate him sharing his leadership pathway with us and that very clear focus on building your teams and building the capability of the people in those teams. As always, thank you for following. Please drop a like or subscribe to help us grow the channel. Have a great day, rest of your week, and we'll catch everyone on the next episode of Talking Leadership TV.